Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, and also the next, we're going to be looking at the objective examination for temporomandibular joint dysfunction. In this video, we're going to look at the neck or cervical component of that exam, and then in the follow-up video, the next video, we'll continue on with the TMJ component, and then also try to take various presentations of TMD and try to classify it into what treatment approach tends to work the best. And again, every patient's different, but if you've never treated TMD before, it can be helpful to have a starting direction for what treatments might work best for various patient presentations. Now with any TMD case, I don't care what it is, we always start with the neck, the cervical objective exam. And the idea behind this is we want to potentially rule out the neck as directly causing their TMJ pain or whatever dysfunction it is. And when I say directly causing it, I mean any one of these neck tests you see here, range of motion, strength, any neck test, if it reproduces their familiar jaw pain, then the neck is directly involved and you would actually treat this more as a neck case than a TMD case. So that might look something like, I say rotate your head to one side, so maybe we do right rotation, oh, there's my jaw pain right there. That would be an example of a case where in all likelihood this is a neck case because I didn't do anything with the jaw. I moved the neck in some way. Maybe it was a strength test that reproduced the jaw pain. We need to know if that happens because if that's the case and we just go after the TMJ and do TMJ interventions, we might get the patient a little better, but we're missing the mark by a wide margin. Okay, so it's always wise to start with the neck. And the first item here is asking if they have headaches. Now that's really part of the subjective exam. And I include it here though because it gives us a really good idea of whether or not there's any neck dysfunction in the first place. Because a lot of times these headaches go with the jaw pain. And the three main types of headaches we're concerned with are cervicogenic tension and migraine. Now you say, well, Kevin, only the cervicogenic is related to the neck. False. Cervicogenic has neck in the name because the headache in a cervicogenic case is referred from the neck. It's simply referred pain from the upper cervical spine via the trigeminal cervical nucleus. But if we look at tension headaches, no, it's not referred from the neck. But in tension headaches, generally speaking, yes, it can be exacerbated or increased by stress, but there's almost always some kind of neck thoracic, scapular dysfunction that's creating some kind of imbalance that's causing usually the temporalis and other muscles of that area to tighten up, then you get tension headaches as a result. And then migraines. And there's some people that might argue that that's more of a neurological consideration, but there's a very large, perhaps majority percentage that is musculoskeletal. If it wasn't that way, then we wouldn't have profound impacts on the severity, the irritability, frequency, duration of the migraines. And we know that we actually can by addressing impairments in the cervical, scapular, and thoracic regions. So anytime somebody has any of these headache types, that is a clue that we've got some kind of cervical, thoracic, or scapular dysfunction, or a combo that needs to be addressed, and it may possibly be related to their jaw pain, okay? Now, the next thing we're gonna go into is part of the test in sitting, and that is cervical active range of motion with overpressure. If we are trying to rule out the cervical spine, not only do we need to take them through these movements, but we need to apply overpressure, okay? So for example, with flexion, I say to somebody, okay, I want you to tilt your head forward as far as you can, okay? Does that cause any pain? No. I haven't ruled out that motion. What I need to do is add that overpressure, and maybe it still doesn't cause any of their jaw pain. But I don't know unless I add that overpressure. Same thing, extension, tilt back, far as you can, fair enough, no pain, add overpressure, right? So you do that with all of those motions, flexion, extension, side bending, rotation, and even quadrant. And then we're gonna move on to cervical strength, flexion, extension, side bending, and rotation. Now, some people would say, don't even worry about cervical strength. Well, I'm gonna give you a good reason to actually worry about it. 
And it has to do with a case that I had when I was a very young physical therapist. When I first started, uh, this kid came in, he's 17 years old, and he had jaw pain. And I forget on which side it was. And I did start out with cervical active range of motion. I did apply over pressure, and that was all negative, right? He had excellent range of motion, as you would expect for someone who's 17, and overpressure did not provoke any jaw pain. And I just said, you know what? We're probably good. I'm just going to move on. And we went into some other TMJ assessment and eventual treatment, and he did get better um, over the course of like three or four visits, but then he plateaued, and he was plateaued for a couple of weeks. So I said to myself, you know what? Just for the heck of it, I'm going to go back and assess cervical strength. Well, guess what? Cervical flexion, resist that. Oh, there's my familiar jaw pain. Cervical flexion strength testing reproduced his familiar jaw pain. There was no jaw movement, no pressure on the jaw. I'm not, I don't have my hands on it at all. But that strength test reproduced it. And it was also a three plus. So we had to do some work getting the cervical flexors stronger, getting that movement stronger. And we did, and eventually he was discharged. So don't think that you can just neglect cervical strength. It may be a component of their familiar jaw pain and symptoms. Now, from there, I'll usually have the patient get in supine. Now, one thing that's not listed here is assessing cervical segmental mobility. So, you know, your joint play assessments on the necks, maybe they have opening restrictions, closing restrictions. I don't necessarily do that immediately unless there's something they say to me that leads me to that. It's very unlikely that you're gonna actually provoke jaw pain with the segmental testing. So I'll usually save that for last unless they give me some reason where I might want to assess that. Like maybe they say, you know, when I tilt my head back in this quadrant, I get this pain back here. Like it feels like it just doesn't wanna go anymore then maybe I'll assess it. But usually you're good to go without that one. But again, if everything here is negative, you should probably rule it out at the end. But when they're in supine, I'm going to assess upper cervical mobility because this is much more likely to be a contributor to TMD than the, that of the lower cervical spine. And we're looking specifically at mobility of the OA joint, atlanto-occipital, and then also the AA joint, atlanto-axial. So for the atlanto-occipital joint, OA, so C0, C1, we're looking at flexion and extension. Now, OA flexion is the motion of the OA joint that is seen with cervical retraction. So this. OA extension is the movement of the atlanto-occipital joint in cervical protraction. Now, take a guess which one is generally limited in people, if there's a limitation. 99.99% of the time, it's a limitation in OA flexion because we sit like this all the time. There's seldom any limitation in OA extension. I have yet to see one. Okay, It's not common. Um, if they have a limitation in OA flexion, you should probably mobilize that because that is in the upper cervical spine. And if they're not able to get into this position at the very least, they're probably stuck more out here. And that position does put an extra load on both TMJs. It is definitely something to address. And we cover that, how you go about that, in other videos. So make sure to take a look at those on my channel. Now, AA rotation. So atlanoaxial rotation, C1, C2. This is essentially just the cervical flexion rotation test. This is a special test used in the assessment of the neck. Uh, I just have it listed here as AA rotation. And we also cover that in a separate video. And remember that the cervical flexion rotation test can be positive for cervicogenic headache, for just straight up neck pain, usually localized to the AA joint or nearby, or it could potentially reproduce jaw pain. Now, if it just simply reproduces cervicogenic headache, if it reproduces neck pain, maybe you want to treat those. But if it reproduces their jaw pain, that is a big flashing lights, radars going off, that this jaw pain is very much related to the neck, particularly the upper cervical spine. Now, from there, we're already in supine doing these assessments. We're then gonna move on to the deep neck flexor endurance test. Now, the reason I perform the upper cervical mobility testing first is because if OA flexion in particular is limited, and particularly very limited, 
there is no reason to do a deep neck flexor endurance test because to do the deep neck flexor endurance test, you're in supine, you have to be able to get into this position. If their OA flexion is limited, they're not going to be able to get into that position well enough to even perform that test in the first place. So you're always best assessing whether or not they have the mobility. If they do, great, move on to a DNFE test. If they don't have the mobility, mobilize it. Okay? But then you do a DNFE test, deep neck flexor endurance test. And when you're doing this, yes, there's a, there's slightly different standards for normal time for men versus women. I think for men, it's a little above 30 seconds. For women, it's a little below 30 seconds. I usually just do a flat 30 seconds. Is that against evidence? Maybe a little bit, but I don't have to memorize the numbers. 30 seconds is good enough for me because it gives you, generally speaking, all the information you need. First of all, are they able to hold it? If they can't even hold it up for 30 seconds and they have to put the head down, and let's say it's not really painful, it's just that they physically can't hold that up, that tells me they have gross neck muscle weakness. Probably some issues in the, in the sternocleidomastoids, the neck flexors, but especially those deep neck flexor muscles, and we're going to want to address those. Is there compensations? And by compensations, we're mainly talking about those of the SCM. So you have somebody in this test, right? And over time, they start to lose, I'm exaggerating, but they lose that chin tuck and then they reestablish it and they might lose it again, they reestablish it. When you see something like that, whether it happens one time in the test over a long period or multiple times with higher frequency, that is a compensation and that generally indicates weakness of the deep neck flexor muscle group. And then we ask, is there any pain associated with this test? And the pain could be reproduced in a variety of spots. It could be in the neck. It could be in the CT junction or upper thoracic spine. And those are certainly worth consideration. But especially if the pain is in their jaw, if it's their familiar jaw pain reproduced by this test, absolutely, we need to be going after the upper cervical spine, in particular the deep neck flexors, possibly mobilizing OA flexion, strengthening the deep neck flexors. Now that concludes the neck component of the objective exam, and by this point you should know what the impairments are of the neck, and you should know which ones, if any, reproduce their familiar jaw pain, and how you go about navigating that with the appropriate treatment selection and approach. We'll be talking about that at the end of the next video. Speaking of the next video, that's where we're going to cover all these TMJ items, and then we'll talk about specific treatment approaches. But before we conclude this video, I want to mention a couple other quick things. And these things are more time dependent on how much you have left in the initial evaluation to do, because remember, we still have to get through these TMJ items right here, which don't really take that long, but you still need to have time to do those and talk about treatment. So if you have time, you might consider assessing scapular strength. Remember, if the shoulder girdle is weak, particularly the muscles that pull the shoulders back, that's going to create an unfavorable position for the neck and the head, and that, coupled with cervical weakness, can put a lot more pressure, load, on the jaw contributing to their TMD. So if there is shoulder girdle weakness, you want to start addressing that as well. Now, if you don't have time to do that and you just want to, on the first session, give somebody rows, that's a pretty benign exercise. It has a lot of benefits and really not a lot of cost to it. So it's a pretty safe exercise to give. If you really want to be conservative, you can do scapular retractions, but I sometimes do that even without assessing the strength. Um, because in the vast majority of people that have TMD, let's be honest, they have scapular weakness. Most Americans have scapular weakness unless they specifically train those muscles with high resistance. Okay. Um, another thing not listed here is thoracic mobility. So thoracic extension, flexion, side bending, rotation. And the most common two to be limited in somebody with TMD are going to be thoracic extension and thoracic rotation. And we'll have other videos in the future where we start addressing how to go about fixing those. So Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the net component of the TMD objective exam. In the next video, like I mentioned, we're going to go over these TMJ test items, and then we're going to talk about a very general approach to treatment selection, which might be useful if you've never actually gone about treating a case like this in the past. So 
Thank you for watching this video. Please make sure to like, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you.